Hey everybody, welcome back to Garage Quest The Books. I'm Mae McDonough and today we're talking about Mordenkainen's Tomb of Foes. Stick around. <laughs> Mordenkainen's Tomb of Foes is the latest release from Wizards of the Coast. It is a supplemental D&D book, and uh, it is, I would say, five parts lore, one part bestiary. Uh, so without any further ado, let's open it up and look at it. Now, of course, with any good Wizards of the Coast D&D supplement, there is a brief preface in this book. Now in this preface, there are some words here from Shemeshka the Marauder, as well as a few words from Mordenkainen's loyal servant, Court. And uh, it's pretty brief. There's not much to it. Uh, so let's just move on straight into chapter one. So chapter one begins with the Blood War, which is the story of origins for the Hordes of the Abyss and the Legions of the Nine Hells for, quote, supremacy of the cosmos. This goes on to describe all the locations, legions, factions, cults, lords, and boons involved in this war, as well as providing new tiefling subraces, which is always fun, and a demon customization table. Chapter two is basically the origin story of elves. It also gives a in-depth look at their outlook and behaviors. And when I say in-depth, I mean really in-depth. This is a dense chapter of lore. <laughs> um, if you are a lore enthusiast, this is probably the book for you. Chapter 2 also comes along with some new sub-races for elves, my favorite of which is the sea elf, because what? I mean, they live in the water? I don't know. I, I mean, it makes sense. I, I, I won't question the masters. They also get a plus one to their uh, constitution ability score, and they can speak Aquin, which is really weird. Chapter 3, Dwarves and Dwergar. So chapter 3 tells us about the divide between the otherwise joyful dwarves race and their materialistic clan of Dwergar. Now, it also goes through uh, different dwarven cultures, deities, enemies, and even their drinking habits. The best part of this chapter is the Dwergar subrace itself. Now, the Dwergar is impatient, ambitious, no stranger to cruelty, and even paranoid about his fellow adventurers when adventuring in a party. So this subrace actually makes for a really great addition into your game, which I recommend you check out. Chapter 4, GIF and their endless war. So chapter four goes into the race of the Gith, a race that was once enslaved by mind flares. Um, and in breaking free from their enslavement, somehow divided into two different groups. The Githyanki, a pillage and plundering sort of sub-race, and the Githzerai, a pacifist race. Now, both sub-races are both psychically and martially gifted, so they make for some really interesting dynamic characters, and uh, I would really look forward to seeing what characters people come up with with these guys. So let's move on. Chapter 5, Havelings and Gnomes. Now, this chapter is all about everyone's favorite friendly little guys, Havelings and Gnomes. These aren't really warring races, these are the non-violent races most of the time. So the lore here is deep, and it is mainly running off of things like superstitions, poetry, deities, subcultures, you know, that sort of thing. 
Now, there's also an additional subrace here. They introduce to us the deep gnome. And of course, the deep gnome comes with its own ability bonuses and some new optional feats. Chapter six is the bestiary, the part that uh, I think a lot of us always look forward to when Wizards of the Coast releases a book like this, New Monsters and Creatures. This bestiary is pretty massive. There are quite a number of new creatures listed in this, along with, of course, their stat blocks, um, as well as a little bit of background about each. Now, one of my favorites is actually the very first creature in this bestiary, and that creature is the Aleep. Now, the Aleep is really bizarre because it's basically the undead residual remnants of a mind who has discovered a dark secret that had been protected beneath the veil of a magical curse. The result is a wispy entanglement of confused psyche fragments and the burdensome pain and agony that comes along with that. And this creature, I think, is one of the most dynamic creatures as far as using it for a storytelling device. You could use this creature to reveal something incredibly painful or world-changing to your adventurers, or it could just make for a really cool and enticing and confusing baddie. Either way, I love it. My second favorite monster Without any further ado, there's been a lot of press about it. You know what I'm talking about. It's the Oblex. Now, I happen to be a big fan of oozes in general. I think that they're pretty dynamic uh, baddies and uh, NPCs. And I really like working them into my games when I can. But this ooze is the uber ooze. This is the ultimate ooze. Now, the Oblex is an ooze that devours its victims in order to feed off of their memories. And not only does it do that, but a grown adult oblex can take the form of either a terrifying ooze or it can take the carnal form of any of its victims. That's pretty terrifying, isn't it? Along with these, of course, are a multitude of many other beasts, baddies, and creatures alike that you can check out throughout Chapter 6. It's amazing. There are some really strange and wild <laughs> creatures in this particular bestiary. So that's it. That is Mordenkainen's Tomb of Foes in a nutshell. I hope you've enjoyed it. I'm Mae McDonough. This has been Garage Quest The Books. Please subscribe and leave a comment below letting me know what book you'd like me to take a look at next. Uh, this has been Garage Quest the Books. Go forth and quest.